So the Dhamma for today is the Sapurisa Panyati, also called the Pandita Panyati. So in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Three is Tika Nipata, in the Chulavaka, there's a, a fifth sutta is uh, about these three Dhammas that are considered to be uh, Sapurisa Panyati, or the Buddha said Pandita Panyatani, Sapurisa Panyatani. So the word Sapurisa means something like a good person, Sat meaning good, but it has a higher meaning, sort of like a, a, a person worth listening to or worth following. It's someone who's on the right path. Usually the Buddha refers to this sort of person as someone worth listening to, worth following, someone with a good teaching. Pandita is a, a, a very old and traditional word that is known throughout India. Um, in modern times we hear the word Pandit, I think, still. Uh, comes from Pandita. It just means someone who is wise or, or knowledgeable. It's often used in a more worldly sense, so it doesn't usually... Um, ref it isn't normally used to refer to a, a spiritual leader, but it's someone someone who is wise, knowledgeable, intelligent, high-minded, that sort of thing. Anyway, the Buddha certainly meant it in terms of one who is wise, one who has wisdom. Banyati is a pretty generic word. It, it means generally something that is made known. That's sort of the literal definition. But how it's used is in two different ways. It's, it's sometimes used to refer to things that are only made known. In other words, they don't exist by themselves. So there are ultimate realities of physical and mental aspects of experience. Pain exists, uh, hardness and softness exist, thinking exists and seeing ex exists. These are not panyati. Panyati is something that is only made known or only brought into being through knowledge or through conception. So it's a word for concepts, like a being. I am a concept. I am a panyati. Uh, objects, these are panyati. But that's not how it's being used here. In this, the other way that panyati is used, it's in terms of something that is made known as a declaration, a policy, or in the Buddha's case, a teaching. So that we have Buddha Panyati, means things the Buddha taught, but also refers, remember in the teaching on the Vinaya, each one of the rules is a Panyati. It's something that the Buddha made known, like a declaration. That's it. We don't quite use the word, this, use language the same in, in English. We don't use the same words, but we have the same idea of something that you declare. So in this case, like a policy, Sapurisa Panyati is because the word Sapurisa and Pandita are more of a worldly term that the Buddha is using in a generic sense for not just Buddhists but in general talking about wisdom. What do wise people make known as policy? So you can think of this sort of as social policy. That's the term I'd use to describe what these are. So, uh, social policy of wise people, of good people. So the three are dana, literally giving, babaja, going forth, going out, and matapitu upatanang, uh, taking care and uh, taking care of your mother and father. These three are called the Buddha called them three sapurisapanyati. So the idea here, I think, is, is a, a very, very b basic framework of just some of the things that should be um, taken up and which are taken up by wise people, should be taken up by people who wish to uh, create a just and fair and wise society. It's an example of how the Buddha's teaching is not just obviously for meditation, but also not just for the monastic world, something that is um, something that touches upon worldly life as well. So the Buddha often would bring up these topics that were of value and use to lay people.
Anyway, of course, these are also valuable for us as monastics. There are things that in daily life, in worldly life, in ordinary life, in practical sense, have great practical value for us as Buddhists. Giving, giving is a very simple concept, a very obvious one, but the idea is that a society or a group or even an individual who doesn't have this inclination to give is uh, uh, missing some kind of uh, depth of, of uh, understanding or is not someone worth following. That a sign or a mark of wisdom, a sign or mark of goodness is someone being generous, a society being generous. So if you think about it, it's a very simple concept and, and one that is doesn't even really need to be mentioned, but yet in modern society is often lacking. And we look at this troubles and uh, stresses, the suffering that is brought about in society to the poor, uh, and just in general in terms of interrelations within society and between societies. We have a, an intense um, inclination in the opposite direction of taking. Instead of giving, we're, we're very much focused on taking and, and very much on regulating taking. How much are you allowed to take? How do we make sure everyone gets what they want to take? So our whole society is, if you look at materialism, materialism, based, materialism isn't based on giving. It's saying take, take as much as you can. And then society will theoretically regulate how much you can take, how much you should take, how to make sure everyone... It's all about taking, you see. Whereas a society that's based on giving, how different that would be. And you see some aspects of most societies have this um, quality of giving, the social n safety nets of social security, health care, welfare, unemployment insurance, these kind of things. Some countries have protections for pregnant women, that sort of thing, uh, parental leave, minimum wage, all of these things uh, often um, you will see in society these important and valuable qualities. The value of giving uh, is, is maybe not readily apparent if you not, don't have some depth of practice or, or appreciation or understanding based on the Buddhist teaching. You think, well, obviously, if you want, you should take. And the only way to get more is to take, right? When in fact, the opposite is true. The truth is that if you look just at the benefit it has for society, taking destroys society. If you look at the benefit for individuals, taking, in fact, destroys the individuals as well. If you have a society where everyone is taking, who gets anything? Nobody gets anything. If you have a society that is only about giving, a society where the inclination and the, the, the policy, the panyati, is giving, everyone gets something. You can see this in a relationship. If you take a romantic relationship between two people, if they're both this constantly focused on the pleasure that they can receive from the other partner, their attachment to them, then neither partner ends up happy. If instead both of the partners are giving, wishing for the, trying to bring happiness to the other, being, being uh, supportive and generous and, and, and that sort of thing, then both sides benefit. In any, in any relationship, the parental relationship, sibling relationship, friendships. And of course, in, even more so in society, but not quite so obvious. In society, if a society is based on giving, the benefits to society are immediate, but the benefits to the individual are immediate as well. Individuals that give are surrounded by generous people, surrounded by appreciative people. In society, if we give to the poor, the Buddha said, the Buddha pointed out that crime only became a, became a real problem in, in ancient history in the origin of things. Crime only became a problem when kings or leaders stopped caring for the poor. This idea of generosity to the poor we have in the um, 
the Chakavati Siyanada Sutta, I believe, one of these suttas anyway, about how um, kings stopped giving. And when the king stopped, stopped giving to the poor, and when the king stopped giving to the poor, the poor had no recourse, but they had to start to steal. Crime became a big issue. Nowadays, crime is rampant. There's uh, this big thing coming up with electronic um, technology. Scamming has become a real issue where everyone is being scammed out of their money. This people's hunger and thirst for taking from others, just taking with no, uh, no right to, to take. Not, not even I give you something, I sell you something and I take your money. I take your money and I give you nothing. Stealing. Theft is, is a huge problem. And it comes about because of uh, doctrine. We're not taught from an early age to give. We're taught from an early age to take. And to the extent that that's true, the, the society begins to break down. To the extent that it's true that our parents teach us to give and our teachers teach us to give and giving is a part of our, our tradition. As you see in, in Sri Lanka or in Buddhist countries, there's a real beauty and a real uh, happiness and, and social order that comes about as a result of giving. So this is the first one, dana. The second one, pabaja. Pabaja is maybe a little bit surprising unless you grew up in a Buddhist country that um, an important part of society is going forth leaving behind the household life. It's surprising because in, in Western society and in many modern societies, there's, there's not so much of this tradition. I know we have, in, in, in my tradition, there are people who become rabbis. In, other, in Christian traditions, people become priests, that sort of thing. These are the things that are familiar to us. But the idea of someone, uh, well, priests maybe, but um, like ministers, that sort of thing. But the idea that someone would go forth, would leave behind the home life, is a little bit foreign. Now, in India, in the time of the Buddha, it actually was quite common, not just among Buddhists. There was this tradition that arose, that, that grew, of people, old people, old men, and sometimes women. When they became too old to work, they would give everything over to their children, and they would go off and live in the forest, and their children would support them. And so there's this, there grew this tradition of people living in the forest, and the people who were living in society would support those people. The Buddha says this is an important part, aspect of society and the, the reason for it being so important, the benefits to Pabaja going forth are first of all to society. Society that has this aspect or the, this section, this uh, part of it, which is people who have left the home life, who have gone to live in the forest, who have gone to live a contemplative life should be quite obvious, then you have people who have introspection and have some higher uh, mindedness. They have this connection with uh, reality, this um, focus that is free from the distractions that come from the, the worldly life of politics and uh, social interactions. Living in the forest, being, living a contemplative life in general gives them a better perspective and allows them, obviously, to offer um, words of advice. And this was a common thing in, in ancient times where a king would have uh, ministers, or, or um, not ministers, advisors. And these advisors would often be people who didn't have to work in the world. They would live a contemplative life and they would be able to study and practice and, and teach uh, higher teachings. A society that doesn't have this, what you have instead is politicians following their whims. You have people making up um, capitalism, communism, economic systems, and uh, political systems based on their own random ideas. And they can't, of course, be expected to have any concrete, uh, d deep understanding of what makes a society great what makes a society prosper. Of course not, because they're too busy uh, politicking. The politicians are being politicians. They're too busy 
They're trying to drum up support, trying to tell people what they think they want to hear, often lying and cheating and, and manipulating others without this back, backing of people who have a better solid uh, appreciation or understanding of reality and, and goodness and so on. There's really um, no mainstay for society, no, no uh, rudder you know, to, keep it on, to keep it on even keel. Obviously, the benefit for individuals is great. Pabhaja is, is, of course, something that imagine if we didn't have the opportunity to leave society. Well, we, we don't have to imagine because for most of our lives, most of us didn't have this opportunity. In our home countries, this, the idea of coming to live in the forest was probably something for most of us very foreign, something that we might only wish for. Many societies don't have this and don't have this appreciation. Even now in Buddhist societies, it's still very hard. People don't have the same appreciation for it as they did maybe in ancient times. Parents often try to convince their children not to leave, uh, not to go and become a monk or that sort of thing, telling them that they're better off to go to work. And so we lose this tradition of having people who uh, are these religious and spiritual advisors to keep society grounded in ethics and goodness. But the benefit to the individuals, of course, to, to have the opportunity for someone who wants to, to develop these higher states of mind, to develop this clarity of mind, for the individual, before you even go to help society, to help others, you've done a great thing for yourself. You have this great opportunity to find true peace and free yourself from the stress and suffering. The Buddha said, uh, life, uh, not the Buddha, not just the Buddha, but the Buddha would reiterate how this is, how someone thinks is that the household life is the dusty road, like a road with carts going and like nowadays the freeway with traffic going and pollution. This is the household life. Uh, going forth is like the open air. It's like living in, living in the forest, living in, in nature. This is like the, 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 the leaving home is like going into the open air where you're not surrounded by all the pollution of society and the pollution of defilements. But the benefit, of course, to, to individuals who haven't ordained is great as well. They have, of course, the opportunity to uh, listen and to learn from people who are in a better position to teach, people who have the grounding to, to guide society. So another one of the things that is uh, essential, the Buddha said, for, uh, for a wise and just society. The third matapitu upatanam is caring for mothers and mother and father. Now, the Buddha is one of the many traditions that talk about the importance of respect for mother and father. They are our first teachers. So it, it, some, it breaks down and is a complicated topic because not every mother and father are, is uh, created equal. Some, mother, some parents are not very wise and not very kind or supportive to their children. So if we... If we generally take this as a policy, we can understand it in a universal sense that it, in general, the value of it should first and foremost be seen towards society, not just on an individual basis where I should, res should I respect my parents or not. Before we ask that question, if we take it as something that is taken as a policy, we can see the value. The value of respect for parents, first of all, it takes care of parents takes care of old people. When old people in society are, are no longer able to do the work to, to make money and support themselves, they become a burden to society. And you see in many modern societies this is true, that children don't look after the parents and so the parents become a burden on society. And it's become a real issue now as, as parents are getting old. A very valuable and, and practical aspect of society is, I mean, it's a very natural thing that Parents are taking care of their children just as their children took care of their parents. But the real value of this is, is, is more on the, 
on the individual side. The value to the individuals is just that in terms of keeping society ethical and moral and just, there's a certain justice that comes from taking care of the people who have taken care of you. And a society that no longer respects and cares for the parents is uh, certainly one that is devoid of wisdom and, and ripe for, for breakdown and corruption and chaos. Pollution of the mind for people who are not grateful is, is, is a real danger. So for most people, well, for all people, our parents have carried us, our mother carried us in her womb for nine months. Mo for many of us, let's say most of us, the father as well was there to care for the woman in her, uh, in her uh, incapacity during the pregnancy. And then for most of us, many, many years went by where our parents cared for us and uh, brought us up. But putting aside individual inconsistency, where for some people this was not the case, again, if we take it as a policy, having it as a policy is of value because it creates this uh, understanding and appreciation both with children and with parents of the important, importance of the relationship between parents and their children. If there is this system or this policy, this, this agreement that we should take care of our parents, then parents as well understand the, their duty and appreciate much more the importance of raising children who are capable of caring for their parents. So not only raising children doesn't only become about the children, it becomes about um, doing your duty to raise people who can then take care of you in your infirmity, in your old age. But again, the depth is, is, is greater than just the practical. It's practic so it's practically valuable to the parents as well to have this sense of um, th this um, sense of the importance of teaching your children and, and raising them to be people who can support you in return. The, depth, the, the, the greatness of this teaching is in gratitude and in wholesomeness and greatness of, of mind. Because no matter whether your parents were good to you or not, that whether they did their duty or not, your duty as children is to your parents. You have a duty to care for them and to do something to better their lives. That's your duty. They are the two people who you can never find a replacement for. They're people who gave you life and they're people who you have a duty in terms of um, creating this stability in society and stability in your own life. By caring for them in their old age. So this is something that uh, is a part of wise and good teaching. The caring for, for one's parents. It's something that for meditators becomes a real issue. If, and if meditators are, uh, have a bad relationship with their parents, they'll find that it stands out during their practice. It's a disruption of their practice and they find themselves yearning to return home to uh, improve their relationship with their parents. Something valuable to think of for that reason as well, that on a, it's on a very deep level something that surprises meditators that caring for your parents is such a, an important part of uh, what it means to be a good and just person. So a simple teaching and something that is only tangentially related to our practice, but still something that we can think of as supporting our practice. If someone is generous and, and giving, this is something that will surround you with people who are generous and giving as well. When we um, give teachings, when we share the Dhamma with others, this surrounds us with people who have the Dhamma and people who appreciate the Dhamma. Just like when we give uh, material support, it surrounds us with people who are uh, well off and able to support themselves and, and generous as well. And so we find ourselves affluent based on our generosity.
when we support the going forth, support, support other people to go forth, then we become uh, replete with people who have knowledge and, and depth of understanding of reality. Even just supporting people as a society to go forth is such a boon for society. And when we support our parents, we create this order and this stability, this um, framework for um, social security, whereby society is uh, at peace and progressing well and, and, and happily. So again, these are the three sappurisapanyati, the social policy of wise and good individuals. So that's the Dhamma for today.